Why? It can be red or white, and as we know from recent government research, it can ruin your life. <laughs> yes, James, child. Just get to the point. Oz has dragged me across the pond to California to see what the new world of wine has to offer. It's nice. Ah. This time we're in Monterey trying cheap and cheerful Chardonnays with the locals. Would you like to try the um, local oak Chardonnay? No, that's fine, thank you. Sure. Thank you. James blags his own vine. How much would you sell that vine for? Well, you know what, I'll just give it to you. And the wine god gets it wrong. The problem, child, is the one in the middle. Well, it isn't, actually. You failed. I, I may have failed, you were boring. Yes, wine lovers, this is the long-awaited sequel, Oz and James's big wine adventure, The New World. Or, as I prefer to put it, Oz and James's bust-based New World booze cruise. It's been two weeks since we pulled our pocket money and hired this ratty old bus. I've made Oz his breakfast. This is the centrepiece of James May's gastronomic <laughs> life. What <laughs> Mr. Clark? I'm deeply grateful and I shall add to your Christmas bonus. I've put up with his abuse. It looks like James has not shaved this morning. No, I just have. Ah, he just has. Never mind, he just hasn't shaved very well. well. And his irritating habits. This is our fridge, and down here is the lock for the door to stop it coming open when we're driving along. The simple rule is, every time you shut the fridge, even if we're parked up, you lock the door so that it becomes a habit and we don't have an accident. Only one person on the earth can't grasp this, and it is... Oz Clark. In return, he has managed to completely ignore my needs. I want an unpretentious, affordable wine which will cost me less than a tenner in the UK. Clark, you're fired. Pipe down, James. We're heading somewhere which will satisfy even your cheap taste. We're heading north of Paso Robles to the dusty desert plains of Monterey. That is a fantastic American view. Look, the rolling hills, then the craggy mountains, and the slowly and incompetently driven RV in the foreground. And over there, the mountains, they're so parched. They're forbidding hot mountains. But this harsh terrain didn't deter winemakers from planting vines during the 1960s. In the space of just 40 years, it's become one of the largest grape-growing regions in California, with a crop worth a staggering $200 million. One of the most popular grapes grown here is Chardonnay. Just think of that. A whole region of America is devoted to fueling the British hen party industry. It's grown here, and it ends up on the pavement outside your house. Well, hang on. This grape's got such a bad rap, but when it's done properly, it produces zesty, bright, refreshing wines, and that's what we're after. You'd be pleased to know a bit of cut that we've got about a bread. fifth of the way up our map. That means lots more wine to drink. We're heading to the Delicato Vineyard, a family business on a grand scale. This narrow gateway is the gateway into the biggest vineyard in the world. Now, mechanisation, you're going to like this. It's yeah. so big, they've actually got picking machines which actually pick two rows at a time. Otherwise, it would take about a month to pick a row of vines. There are rows of vines in this vineyard that are 11 miles long, and you're not listening. That's because I'm trying not to crash the ruddy bus. This is what's known as a wide-angle shot. The gate is smaller than it looks. There are seven different varieties of grapes grown here over an area of 55 square miles, with Chardonnay being the most planted white grape. Morning, it's run by Bill Petrovich and his Australian winemaking sidekick, James Ewart. I mean, to use the English expression, this is chuffing massive, I think it's fair enough. It just goes on for mm. thousands of miles in all directions. How many vines are there on your vineyard? Oh, just under five million. Five million separate vines. Yes. How many cases of wine? Just under three million cases. I mean, wow. yeah, under three, three million cases. Just under three million. Thirty-six million bottles of wine. Six million, million bottles, bottles of wine coming out of this vineyard. Yes. yes. How much there are is some this? countries which don't produce that much. Well, England, for example. England. Well, <laughs> England, obviously. How much? Um, how much is your wine typically? Generally, six six ninety nine to ten pounds so is generally where we're from at. This vineyard, from this vineyard, we've got six pound ninety nine wine. Mm -hmm. James. I told you, I'd find you some. I'm very happy. So this is, we, we are in, in the 
what would you call this, the heartland of the affordable but decent wine. Yeah. yeah. That, I think, if I'm right here... Assuming we like it. Yeah, we, exactly. like it. We, we haven't tried it yet. The interesting thing about winemaking is that unless you're harvesting, there's nothing to do. So in their spare time, these bone-idle vintners go fishing in this chuffing doing, big lake. Had a huge great white on the end of it and he just cut it off. Yeah. Despicable. I'm useless at this. Fortunately, it's well known that one should have white wine with fishing. First, a Pinot Grigio. It's a, it's yeah. a very light wine. In terms of but uh, labelling... Pleasant. If it says Pinot Grigio, it'll be light normally. If it says Pinot Gris, which is the French way of saying the same grape, it'll be fuller in flavour. Now, that's a wine fact. Fuller in flavour, eh? Well, whoever wrote the label for this one was certainly full of something. Laura Donna Pinot Grigio from Monterey. Everyone remembers their first love. That spring, we fell in love when the grapevines were flourishing and the flowers were blooming. We dined, we danced, we laughed. My lady flower, my first love, Laura Donna. You bunch of Jessies. When did you come up with that? <laughs> Who wrote that? Had to be an Australian. Next, a Chardonnay. Oh, God. So this is six or seven pounds a bottle in England, Bill? Yes, yeah, six ninety-nine. And it smells lightly oaked. And quite melony, I'd say. Is that that, fair? That's not a bad sign. I think lightly oaked and quite melony sounds is, is an encouraging smell. It's all right, that, actually. It has got acidity. Mm -hmm. It has got Without acidity. Without acidity, Chardonnay is dead. And it's not uh, too and, woody, either. And a lot of the commercial Chardonnays that we see from California in Britain just they're too sweet, the acidity's not high enough, they're a pointless drink. It's a good chardonnay -y sort of colour yeah. as well. What, whitish? Yeah. No, oh, thank you. It's a the expert will drink. tell you all about it. This is it's a good whitish wine. It won't stay in your shirt. <laughs> you know, I'm very happy with that. This wine can be enjoyed by itself or with your favourite foods. There you go. So, like... Spam, fish fingers. Porridge. <laughs> cheese whiz. Uh, strawberry blancmange. Oh, macaroni cheese, well, macaroni. With, that, but with the with the bits of tomato on, so that yeah, go, and yeah, a uh, sausage, sausage. yeah, or um, black, black forest gato, chicken tikka boona. Do you think it would go? It might get a bit overpowered chicken by a chicken tikka boona, yeah. but it would be all those uh, numbers twelve to twenty six on the on the menu at my local Indian. <laughs> yeah, all of those, or the Chinese even. The spe oh, special mix twenty eight at the Chinese. Special mixed metaphor. Yeah, I feel a sort of mild sense of satisfaction um, because I found. James, an affordable, attractive Chardonnay you can get in the, in the UK. Um, I don't pretend he likes it as much as my posh friend's stuff at $50. He doesn't. But he's so determined to get one. Well, James, you got one, so shut up. You've done well, Mr. Clark, and I have a reward lined up. This enormous vineyard comes complete with its own airstrip. And when they have some more downtime, the workers indulge in another all-American pastime. I like the look of this. Ha <laughs> ha! Drag racing in classic V8 muscle cars with an even bigger drink problem than Oz Clark. That's very funny and very tenuous. Let's just get it over with. Choose your weapons. I can have anything. Anything. I'm strapping myself into a 530 horsepower 1960s Chevrolet Chevelle, while Oz will be riding shotgun in a 503 horsepower Chevrolet Camaro. I've chosen the better vintage. I leave Oz Clark with high notes of dust and a hint of gravel on the nose. 
Then it's back to the camper van, with me as chauffeur, and I'm intent on enjoying the scenery as we head into the Monterey Hills to see another of his posh wine mates. It's a perfect moment, spoiled only by my master's insistence on divulging some advice for life. Viewers, well, you've spent your life take notes. So Don't marry girls you meet at the local sports club when you're 16. Certainly don't ever do the job that your careers master at school wanted you to do. I had two choices, uh, personnel uh, management or dry cleaning. <laughs> what? Why dry cleaning? Uh, well, dry cleaning obviously seemed to him to make sense. Clark's a clean sort of boy. Yes. Maybe. He's quite dry sense of humour, be dry cleaner. <laughs> My next posh wine mate is Oxford graduate and rowing blue Josh Jensen. His mountain grown Calera Chardonnay is a really special, and I just want James to taste them without prejudice and prove to him that this grape, when grown by people like Josh, can produce sublime wine. But Jensen's real passion is Pinot Noir. Now, he's chosen these daunting mountain slopes because of their limestone. Limestone's the burgundy soil. Pinot is the burgundy grape. Several of his vineyard plots are explosively good, yet a new one just yards away simply isn't delivering the quality. He doesn't know why. This vineyard here is a big headache for us because we planted it in 1997 and we're not getting good wines out of it. And, uh, and it's the, just next door to some of your best stuff. Next door to two vineyards that I consider among the best in California, you know, and yet this one is just giving us problem harvest after harvest. So we're ten yards apart. Yeah. Well, I'm about to give up on this one. It's a half million dollars out the window, and it's really, a, it's really, I'm really unhappy about it. Maybe we should try it and decide if we think it's too hard and too tanny. Okay. This is we'll just do that when we get. This is yet another of his plots yeah. to try and get a drink out yeah. of you. Yeah. We should try them all. I think just to be on the safe side. <laughs> This will be a real test of James's developing palette. Can he pick out the problematical Pinot Noir when it's hidden among its more distinguished neighbours? I would say that is the problem, child. I would say that is warmer, softer and more mellow from down below and I'd say that one is slightly more edgy and slightly rawer because it's up on the exposed hill where life is harsh for the grape. Am I right? Well James, it's a difficult test I admit. But you failed. Have I? Well which one is the problem one? The problem child is the one in the middle. Well it isn't actually. Because it certainly is. Well, it isn't, because actually this is my favourite one. And I am the wine drinker of the people. With ideas above your station, who's the expert here? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's jolly nice, and I've probably just saved you your half a million dollars that you're about to throw away. Well, terrific. I'm delighted, and uh, we will put you down for uh, 200 cases. <laughs> I'll take the lot. Five dollars a case, oh. same reason. <laughs> You have already admitted that it's no good, so, you know. Now that I've saved Mr. Jensen half a big one, the least he can do is reward me with a glass of his famous Calera Single Estate Chardonnay. Slightly oaked. Yes. It's nice. Ah! It's slightly oaky, but it has acidity as well and fresh fruit flavours, is that right? And a bit of perfume. If you follow the name, if they make a cheaper version, you're going to like the cheaper version too. That's a wine fact. Good. It's a bit like when... I can't think of a good analogy. Thank God for that. Otherwise, we'd have had to listen to it. <laughs> Time to call it a day. After sleeping off last night's Chardonnay, I've come up with a cunning plan. I reckon Oz needs to feel the ocean breeze through that barren region where his hair used to be. So I'm taking him to the very posh coastal town of Carmel on the famous Route 1. Right, we're going to have to be very careful around this one, otherwise you'll end up with some rocks in your bedroom. Crikey, there's some sort of car show going on. I knew something was up when you put that smart jacket on. Can I remind you, this is a wine programme. By one of those remarkable coincidences that attends the making of this programme, we have arrived in the area during the week-long 
classic and collector's car extravaganza that the Americans simply refer to as Monterey. People come from all over the world. The cars here are not VW Beetles and old Ford Capris. They're very, very exclusive, rare and expensive cars, often with interesting provenance and owned by very famous people. And I've set a wine challenge for Mr. Oz Clark off the television, which is to match wine with classic cars. I'm going to look at a nice classic car and you have to provide me with a wine that is appropriate to the moment. Does that sound fair? It sounds fair. I've given Oz a selection of wines that we've collected on our trip so far. Right. Where should we begin? This. Would you like to start something simple? A Jaguar XK120 from 1952. Not a particularly rare or difficult car to contemplate. Um, oil. Take your time. Read your book. This could take hours. You want something with, with class and which zips along. Given the kind of people I think will be in it, I'd like a, a glass of frothy champagne. Have you got me? No, I haven't. That's not very good. Then, I've got some it? cheap Chardonnay. Let's try that. That doesn't smell too bad. It's acid, isn't it? Yeah. I'm not entirely sure that this should actually go with anything which has got an MOT. Not a very good start. Let's confuse him even more with a real crossbreed. This is a BMW M1. A strange mixture of sort of the German technocrat styled by an Italian. It was originally made in Italy. It... Uh, what are you getting? I was, I was well, like, it looks like a Ford. Cortina to it me. It doesn't look like a Ford Cortina. It does look like a Ford Cortina. It does, I was, well, you're saying that because it's white. Ah. We want something like a Cabernet Sauvignon. It's too dry, but it's also too weighty. It wasn't the most powerful car of its time. It only had a six-cylinder engine. It didn't have an eight or anything like that. But it was very, very crisp, very, very agile. And I think with this, to be honest, you should have had something like an unoaked Sauvignon Blanc. You failed. Try this. Well, I don't know whether I failed or not. You, I, I may have failed, you were boring. This is ridiculous. I'm choosing the next car. That's what I like. America yeah. all over. I bet it's got fruity pipes, woody high notes. That would go really well with a yeah. nice, rich Chardonnay. Nice, rich Chardonnay. This should have woody high notes to go with this peculiarly gorgeous sort of milkshake and soda pop and knickerbocker glory kind of car. Well, actually, I have to say I quite like this because it is woody, it's got the oaky flavour, but it also has a bit of acidity underneath that yeah. and a bit of sharpness. Would you like to try the um, local oak Chardonnay? No, that's fine, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Well, I like it. That's a thumbs up for Oz. 365 GTB4 or Daytona. I've well, got just the one for you. Have you? And what is it? It's a, a, Merlot. It's a Merlot. A Merlot. Now, the reason I got a Merlot because I've always think with Ferraris, they don't sound quite masculine. They sound like a sort of mosquito sort of buzzing in your ear. Do you know what I'm getting slightly off there? Overheating electrical wiring insulation which is a smell you do associate with Italian supercars, so you may have done quite well there. Yeah. It's a bit young to me. The thing about it is it's the Merlot grape. Lots of sizzle, not enough steak. You know, it, it, it promises a lot and doesn't deliver quite enough. And again, it may be a little bit like an Italian supercar. It promises enormous amounts. It looks fantastic. When you actually sit in it and, and, and put the carburetor into gear, the wheels fall off. <laughs> yes, they do have a reputation for, for fragility, if that's what you mean. Watch me what I mean. <laughs> what is this? Is a Merlot? <laughs> what is the defining characteristic of the Merlot? There is a Merlot Mr. called Clark. Marilyn Merlot. <laughs> there is a Merlot called Marilyn Merlot. Merlot, Merlot is easy to pronounce. It's got a relatively soft flavour. Does this go with that? This is a uh, stupid idea, matching wine and cars. Oh, yes, you know, fancy car challenge. Well, it's time to get back on track and visit one of Monterey's true winemaking mavericks. 
We're going to see this bloke called Gary Pisoni. Gary um, Pisoni. Yeah, I thought what you'd like his name. name. Yes, exactly. Well, just try and not make jokes about him. His mother is about 90 and she's actually active around the place. So she won't be particularly amused if you take, take the piss out of her, or take, take the mickey out of her, out of her surname, OK? Rumour has it that in order to turn the family cattle ranch into a wine business, Gary Pisoni broke into a very famous French vineyard and then smuggled some vine cuttings home by hiding them down his trousers. Well, as the French sometimes say of rustic wines, ça peut de mer, it smells... Uh, of... so trust me, James, you're going to love him and his Chardonnay's really tasty. He won't sell his grapes to, to, to people he doesn't like. Uh, he won't sell his grapes to people who don't like his mother's pies and sausages. Uh, he won't sell his grapes to people who, who uh, then make wine out of it, and, and uh, which sells for too much money. I mean, he's a very interesting bloke. Interesting. Deranged is more like it. He drives like my mate from the other programme and looks like a caveman. I'm going to call him Gary Madhead. Excellent. Quite hairy, but that's good. And this area here we have for this windy clone of Chardonnay, where the soil is a little poor. So it's a, soil. And yeah, so we get a little less crop, but it's very intense flavors. Very extracted, nice minerality to it. Look at these grapes here, James. They've got, what's it called, hen and chicken in that guy there. Yeah, chicken But that's actually quite a good thing, isn't it, with Chardonnay? Mm -hmm. chicken you get a lot really. of intensity. Can I, can I ask a question? Well, there seems to be a Pinot Noir vine right in the middle of your Chardonnay. Yeah, he's a, he's a black sheep. Is that deliberate? No, it was just a mistake. That's just about enough grapes for you, James. That's the Could you make a bottle out of that? Mm-hmm. Well, how much would you sell that vine for? This is a direct offer you're having here, Gary, so you give, well, give a sensible answer. When's your birthday? Maybe I'll give it to you for your birthday. Well, I was just thinking I could come out here every year, make my bottle of wine. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'll just give it to you. Would you? Yeah. And we'll put a little name out here. James Private Reserve. <laughs> I'd like that. That's good down the pub, isn't it? I've, I've got You're a... in trouble now, Gary. I tell you, you, you'll be seeing this guy every year for the next 50 years. It doesn't bother me. Because I you own... haven't seen how much he drinks. Well, I own a vineyard. He's not going to run out of wine, don't worry. He's not going to run out of wine, this bloke. Oh, he's got his priorities right. You heard him. This vine is mine. And that's a vine fact. And now you have to learn how to look after it. Grapes need exactly the right amount of sun exposure at the right time of day to produce good wines. Right now, we've got to take all the leaves off on the morning sun side. See how we've got quite a few leaves here? Yep. Well, I expose those clusters. That one. Well, you're just going to point at them and I pull them off. Yeah, I'm the expert. You, I'm telling you what to do. <laughs> uh, that one. That one. Yes, that one. <laughs> that one. Do you normally do all this yourself, the whole vineyard? No, uh, no we've got 20 helpers. They, uh, they pick the grapes, they pull, pull the leaves off, they drop clusters. They're wonderful workers. We have parties for them every year. I give them a couple cases of wine a year. Where do you get the workers from? Oh, they're from Mexico. Could um, there be a California wine industry without Mexican workers? It'd be pretty rough, because the Americans don't know how to do it or they don't want to do it. Now He's try very, it, right? he... Yeah, yeah, try a whole cluster. Here, you, you know the way I like to do it? I, like to, I tell people, I like the monkey bite it. Mm. That's where you get the fl real flavor. What do I do? Just shove it in the face? Yeah, just shove it in the face. Watch your shirt. Spit out the rest. That's the way. That's the way. Just like your mom told you not you're supposed to not supposed to do that. God, they taste terrific. Mmm, well done then. You really get the flavors. Mm -hmm. That one's a bit riper. Now, you know those wild pigs come into the vineyard to mm -hmm. eat these things. And I tell the wild pigs, if you eat my grapes, I'll eat you. They don't believe what I do. And Gary Madhead is a man of his word. We're invited to join a family barbecue. His dad is a Normandy Landing's World War II veteran and his mum still runs the business, signing the checks every Friday for all the employees. She probably doesn't trust Gary. I wouldn't mind being Mexican and working for Gary Madhead. The food is delicious. But are his Chardonnays any better than the others from Monterey? Mm, nice. Terrific. It is oaky, but not excessively oaky, and it has that that brightness that you would get from a proper English apple plucked off the tree. If you think this Chardonnay is just cheap plonk, drunk by people on hen parties in the back of those ugly stretch limousines, it needn't be. It can be like this. How much is this, sir? A bottle? Yeah. 40 bucks. 20 quid, 21 quid. Not quite cheap enough, but not disastrous. But remember, that's really very nice. Single vineyard, special place. Now I want to try this rosé, too. 
This is Rosea Pinot Noir. What we do when we first crush the grapes, we bleed off maybe five or ten percent of the juice to make a rosé, and then the remaining Pinot Noir is more intense, more extracted, because it has a higher skin to juice ratio as it ferments. Mm. Because in a red wine, the red colour comes from the skins, the juice is actually clear, isn't it? So the rosé is rosé because it's been exposed to the skins for a while, but not as long as a red wine has. Which oh, is exactly what a wine saying. fact from James. Yeah, right? I, I love it when you talk like this. How much is this, a bottle? This is $18 a bottle. That's ten pounds. Nine. Well, nine. Not. <laughs> well done. I told you I'm getting He's it. He's done it. A good quality wine for ten pounds or less. I'm going to have some more of this as well. What about doing a wine tasting of all these different wines rather than just saying to Gary, you're having doing a wine drink. He Gary, does wine you... drinking. So I try to do wine tasting. You may actually prefer to drink with him than with me because. What, what's your view, Gary? Drinking or tasting? I don't taste wine. I drink wine. There you go. Perfect. Well, just a minute, James, before you get completely hammered with your new friend, I've got one last challenge that requires you to be able to see straight. This is our final showdown. Remember those four bottles of wine from the classic car show challenge? I want to know if James can pick out my favourite bottle of wine from that particular bunch. But I want you to choose one wine from those four which you think is good and match the cars well. And the other three, I've got a Winchester 243 here and you will have to blast the other three from the face of this planet. Now, James, you know this gun has killed a lot of wild hogs in the vineyard. So, you won't miss. Okay. Where from? Well, not from two yards. <clears throat> Put it against your shoulder tight. Take your time. Hmm, there's two Chardonnays. I'm gonna try and save the Chardonnay on the right. Oz's favorite, I reckon. You got two! <laughs> Two in one shot! Okay. Oh, wow, go ahead, you got another shot in there. Watch your ears, everybody. Wow! The other one has been knocked over, but, but it, it exists still. Yes, exactly. And that was it the one survived. that was from the Monterey region and had the terroir of the car show. You could virtually smell the kerosene and the petrol in the wine. That's the one with terroir. That's the one that survived. <laughs> well done, my son. Where did you the don't... kerosene come from? I'm slightly baffled about uh, that. Doesn't it? cars run on kerosene? No. Oh, well, I knew it was a petroleum-type term. I thought that was an excellent yeah. challenge, yes. And um, I think wine shooting is probably the new sport of kings. Right. I arrived okay, at now. wine that wine. he would have chosen, the, the local wine with the sense of place, the terroir, the reasonable price as well, which is very encouraging. I think it was about 18 or $19, so less than 10 quid, which is what I wanted. Very, very tasty, lightly oaked, full of acid flavour. Excellent. And shot to sh That's another region ticked off, and thanks to fast cars, loud guns and good grub, James is still on board and learning. Five million separate vines. Yes. How many cases of wine? Just under three million cases. I mean, wow. yeah, under three, three million cases. Just under three million. Thirty-six million bottles 36 of wine. Six million, million bottles, bottles of wine coming out of this vineyard. Yes. yes. How much there are is some this? countries which don't produce that much. Well, England, for example. England. Well, <laughs> England, obviously. How much? Um, how much is your wine typically? Generally, six six ninety nine to ten pounds so is generally where we're from at. From this vineyard, we've from got this six pound ninety nine wine. Mm -hmm. James. I told you, I'd find you some. I'm very happy. So this is, we, we, we are in, in the, what would you call this, the heartland of the affordable but decent wine. Yeah, yeah. that I think, if I'm right here. Assuming we like it. Yeah, exactly. We, like it, we, we haven't tried it yet. The interesting thing about winemaking is that unless you're harvesting, there's nothing to do. So in their spare time, these bone-idle vintners go fishing in this chuffing big lake. Had a huge grey white on the end of it, and he just cut it off. Yeah. Despicable. I'm useless at this. Fortunately, it's well known that one should have white wine with fishing. First, a Pinot Grigio. It's a, it's yeah. a very light wine. In terms of uh, labelling, 
unpleasant. If it says Pinot Grigio, it'll be light normally. If it says Pinot Gris, which is the French way of saying the same grape, it'll be fuller in flavour. Now, that's a... Wine. It can be red or white, and as we know from recent government research, it can ruin your life. <laughs> yes, James, child. Just get to the point. Oz has dragged me across the pond to California to see what the new world of wine has to offer. It's nice. Ah. This time we're in Monterey trying cheap and cheerful Chardonnays with the locals. Would you like to try the um, local oak Chardonnay? No, that's fine, thank you. Sure. Thank you. James blags his own vine. How much would you sell that vine for? But you know what, I'll just give it to you. And the wine god gets it wrong. The problem, child, is the one in the middle. Well, it isn't, actually. You failed. I, I may have failed, you were boring. <laughs> yes, wine lovers, this is the long-awaited sequel, Oz and James's Everyone big actually, wine adventure, I The New World. Them. Or, as I prefer to put it, Oz and James's bus-based New World booze cruise. It's been two weeks since we pulled our pocket money and hired this ratty old bus. I've made Oz his breakfast. This is the centerpiece of James May's gastronomic <laughs> life. Morty, Mr. Clark. I'm deeply grateful and I shall add to your Christmas burgers. The wine fact. Fuller in flavour, eh? Well, whoever wrote the label for this one was certainly full of something. Laura Donna Pinot Grigio from Monterey. Everyone remembers their first love. That spring, we fell in love when the grapevines were flourishing and the flowers were blooming. We dined, we danced, we laughed. My lady flower, my first love, Laura Donna. You bunch of Jessies. When did you come up with that? <laughs> Who wrote that? Had to be an Australian. Next, a Chardonnay. Oh, God. So this is six or seven pounds a bottle in England. Well, yes, six ninety-nine. And it smells lightly oaked. And quite melony, I'd say. Is that that, fair? That's not a bad sign. I think lightly oak and quite melony sounds is, is an encouraging smell. It's all right, that actually. It has got acidity. Mm -hmm. It has got Without acidity. Without acidity, Chardonnay is dead. And it's not uh, too and, woody either. And a lot of the commercial Chardonnays that we see from California in Britain just are too sweet. The acidity is not high enough. They're a pointless drink. It's a good Chardonnay -y sort of colour yeah. as well. What, whitish? Yeah. No, thank you. It's a the expert drink, will tell you all about it. This is it's a good whitish wine. It won't <laughs> stain your shirt. Yes. I'm very happy with that. This wine can be enjoyed by itself or with your favourite foods. There you go. So, like spam, fish fingers, porridge, cheese whiz, uh, strawberry blancmange. I've put up with his abuse. It looks that like James has not shaved this morning. No, I just have. Ah, he just has. Never mind, he just hasn't shaved very well. And his irritating habits. This is our fridge, and down here is the lock for the door to stop it coming open when we're driving along. The simple rule is, every time you shut the fridge, even if we're parked up, you lock the door so that it becomes a habit and we don't have an accident. Only one person on the earth can't grasp this, and it is... Oz Clark. In return, he has managed to completely ignore my needs. I want an unpretentious, affordable wine which will cost me less than a tenner in the UK. Clark, you're fired. Pipe down, James. We're heading somewhere which will satisfy even your cheap taste. We're heading north of Paso Robles to the dusty desert plains of Monterey. That is a fantastic American view. Look, the rolling hills, then the craggy mountains, and the slowly and incompetently driven RV in the foreground. And over there, the mountains, they're so parched. They're forbidding hot mountains. But this harsh terrain didn't deter winemakers from planting vines during the 1960s. In the space of just 40 years, it's become one of the largest grape-growing regions in California, with a crop worth a staggering $200 million. One of the most popular grapes grown here is Chardonnay. Just think of that. A whole region of America is devoted to fueling the British hen party industry. It's grown here, and it ends up on the pavement outside your house. Well, hang on. This grape's got such a bad rap, but when it's done properly, it produces zesty, bright, refreshing wines, and that's what we're after. You'd be pleased to know Take a bit of cut that we've got about a it. fifth of the way up our map. That means lots more wine to drink. 
We're heading to the Delicato Vineyard, a family business on a grand scale. This narrow gateway is the gateway into the biggest vineyard in the world. Now, mechanization, you're gonna like this. It's so big, they've actually got picking machines which actually pick two rows at a time. Otherwise, it would take about a month to pick a row of vines. There are rows of vines in this vineyard that are 11 miles long, and you're not listening. That's because I'm trying not to crash the ruddy bus. This is what's known as a wide-angle shot. The gate is smaller than it looks. There are seven different varieties of grapes grown here over an area of 55 square miles, with Chardonnay being the most planted white grape. Morning, it's run by Bill Petrovich and his Australian winemaking sidekick, James Ewart. I mean, to use the English expression, this is chuffing massive, I think it's fair enough. It just goes on for mm. thousands of miles in all directions. How many vines are there on your vineyard? Oh, just under five million. 